We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family, because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God. As the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love and honor her, and be willing to lay down my life for her, as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God. With all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Dad, because of you, I will be courageous. We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family, because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God as the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love and honor her, and be willing to lay down my life for her, as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God. With all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Dad, because of you, I will be courageous. We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family, because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God. As the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love 
and honor her and be willing to lay down my life for her as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God with all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Dad, because of you, I will be courageous. We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God as the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love and honor her, and be willing to lay down my life for her, as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God. With all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Dad, because of you, I will be courageous. We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God as the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love and honor her, and be willing to lay down my life for her, as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God. With all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. 
I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Dad, because of you, I will be courageous. We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God as the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love and honor her, and be willing to lay down my life for her, as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God. With all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution. To fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Dad, because of you, I will be courageous.
We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family, because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God. As the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love and honor her, and be willing to lay down my life for her, as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God. With all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Good afternoon and welcome to Courageous Man. I'm sure by now everyone knows where we are heading. Last week we started with Pastor T.K. Mensa and we spoke about where are the men, purpose and mission, what are men called to, and we spoke about chains of grace. Am I my brother's keeper? Today, we are back again, and we will talk about called to excellence. Called to excellence. Many young men have traversed this earth and have found themselves wanting at different levels. The essence of these discussions is to help all of us to find our purpose and to live according to God's will for our lives. Today we are blessed to have someone to speak to us about called to excellence. Why is there a call to excellence for every man? Why is the calling to excellence critical? Whose who standards dictate this? What is excellence? Today we have a gentleman who is a chartered insurer and he's been working with young people all his life, for more than 30 years, I think. In fact, he had, he's had very humble beginnings as a direct sales agent at Standard Chartered Bank and he's currently the Chief Strategy Officer at Prudential Life. 
And if this man is the chief strategy officer at Prudential Life, it means he knows about excellence. Because I am an insurance person, and if someone is coming from that fold and is with Prudential, then you know what we're talking about. So we will invite him, but before he comes, let's pray. Our Father, again, in Jesus' name, do we thank you for the privilege of service. We thank you that sinful as we are, selfish as we are, human as we are, we could represent you on earth somehow and speak your word to your people, converting lives, changing people, and bringing them back on track onto you. We thank you. This afternoon, we gathered once again to listen to your word. We pray that you melt our hearts, give us understanding, give us wisdom to appreciate the power of your word. We pray for the speaker, set him aside and speak through him. So through him, we may come to know you. We will actually behold you and by beholding, we become like your son, Jesus. We thank you so much for hearing us. Speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name, amen. So when I invite Elder Mr. Tete Aitevi to speak to us, thank you. Thank you very much, Elder Latte. <laughs> now, myself and Mr. Latte have had a long working experience um, in our former life. Um, before I moved over at uh, move over to Prudential, um, ten years in the fold of um, one company that we both served very well. Uh, before I moved over to Express Life, which was acquired by Prudential. And um, it's been a wonderful nine years. Time flies by so quickly. Um, actually, next week, next week Wednesday would be exactly, this coming Wednesday would be exactly nine years when we took the decision um, to jump over. And boy, God, has it been a journey. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So the theme today, and I, I, I wonder whether I'm the one qualified to speak on this theme called To Excellence. But our elder dear Mankra convinces me that I have something to offer. <laughs> and because he says I have something to offer, that I need to make it a point to come and speak to the young people and tell them what it is I have to offer in this area um, of excellence. Um, and I would see, whilst we look at the reference scriptures and discuss what the scriptures say, um, we would also probably pick a few anecdotes from my own examples in my life and then see how we can build a life of excellence as young people, particularly in this world today. Now, the reference scripture or the book of the Bible I would focus on is no other person than Daniel. Because scripture says that Daniel was one in whom was found the spirit of excellence. So we cannot have a discussion on excellence based on scripture without making reference to Daniel. So for all the young people on the link to the Courageous, Courageous Men platform today. Make that mental note, and I'll leave you an assignment in that regard at the end of this discussion. So, put your, if you're using a traditional Bible, like I expect you to, <laughs> put your thumb <laughs> in Daniel, and then let's scoot over to Second Peter chapter 1. We'll build it from there, and then... Um, We'll see how this discussion goes. Hallelujah. God has been good to us. And the discussion of, of, of excellence is one thing that we can't leave this generation with. Extremely important. Okay. So Second Peter chapter 1. I did not have loved to read the whole um, 1 to 6. But I'll just pick it up from verse, verse 3 which says that according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto, the life and unto life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence at your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So it maketh neither unfruitful nor barren in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that it improves the communication of our faith. Now, I like the first line that he used. He said, giving all diligence. He said the foundation of diligence. That means that hard work underscores our steps to excellence. Now, I want you to note that down. It says, giving all diligence. Diligence is hard work. Consistent, focused hard work. Not once in a while, when the attitude is good, the environment is wonderful, then we apply ourselves to it. But it's a lifestyle of continuous focus on hard work. It says giving all diligence as the foundation for this discussion. Then he talks about our faith. He said, add to your faith. So we lay the foundation of hard work in the knowledge of our faith. What makes us who we are, our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father that he serves and our commitment to him. That faith that we have is the foundation of our excellence. So we are the ones who have the grace of excellence beyond what the world has. So we cannot have levels of excellence which are below that which the world has. And that's a big challenge to us. Because excellence in itself, by Peter's description, is founded on hard work and our faith. So if you remove the faith out of it, um, your excellence cannot be looked at as complete excellence. In the eyes of God, in the sight of God, it would be lacking. Hallelujah. So having established that foundation, it says to your, to your faith, add virtue. And virtue, there's good behavior, establish the right morals in your life. And to your virtue, add knowledge. And to knowledge, add self-control. And to self-control, patience. And to patience, godliness. Pursuing the things of God. Hallelujah. Now, we can, we can just park our bus here for the rest of the time and not move anywhere. <laughs> but I set this foundation because of what we're going to discuss about Daniel. And Daniel is a more humane version of living this out in real life. And the Bible recorded that about his life. And for me, it's interesting about the kind of things that are said about Daniel. And many a time, when people think about excellence, we, our biggest challenge is that we cannot marry a spiritually astute and solid person with worldly ways of doing things. The only way of excellence we know is to be excellent in spiritual things in front of God. But that is actually not the complete picture in the sight of God. People like Daniel exemplify what excellence means, of a, what excellence of a believer in the world looks like. And that's what matters to God. So the foundation of faith is established. Daniel was a Jewish boy brought up according to the ways of the nobles in the Jewish hierarchy. So he had been well-schooled and well-trained as a Jew. Okay, so let's turn our Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Hopefully, I can make sense to you as we go along and set the tone for quite a lot of questions to come at the end. Okay, so Daniel chapter 1. I mean, at the time when we read Daniel, um, we like the more dramatic parts about um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cast into the, cast it into the um, fairy furnace and Daniel himself cast into the den of lions. Well, those are the more dramatic ones. But let's look at the foundation that was laid of who he was. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, and he, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, 
and of the king's seed and of the princess. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding, and I'm sure you might not never have paid attention to this, understanding science. Daniel had an understanding of science. In the olden times, he had been brought up in the lineage and line of scientists. I'd always thought of Daniel as a spiritual man. I hadn't thought of him as a learned, cunning in wisdom, in all knowledge, scientist. That changed my perception of Daniel. He was a learned man. I'm comparing this to Peter's discourse and saying that add knowledge to your faith. Add good behavior and morals and integrity added to your faith, but also add knowledge. Now, the Greek explanation of the word he used as knowledge in 2 Peter 1, because he had already spoken about our faith in God in the, in the preceding line, when he spoke about knowledge, the Greek rendition says that be erudite. That means that grow in the knowledge of the arts and the sciences. Now, Peter speaking like that in 2 Peter is interesting because Peter was a fisherman who had encountered Paul. And at the end of the second book of Epistle of Peter, he says that we should look, go after knowledge and people who are untrained twist knowledge to a destruction. And he was making reference to the fact that people like Paul had set an example in knowledge. Saying that it is better to have knowledge than not have knowledge. Because he, the fisherman, had seen his fellow apostle Paul, a learned lawyer, and said having knowledge is important. And he comes here to say that if you add knowledge to your faith, the congregation of your faith shall not be unfruitful. Are you with me? So therefore, establishment of ourselves in the lines of excellence means that we add knowledge, worldly knowledge to our faith, the foundation of our work with God. We need to add an understanding of what is happening around us in our environment to our knowledge in God. Now that's interesting because in the environment that we grew in, worldly things and knowledge has been subordinated in a certain way. And I think that the church in recent times is coming to the point where an appreciation of the fact that people are well-rounded is an important asset for believers. Um, is, is an important asset for the church, having people who are well-rounded in knowledge. But that acceptance now, these scriptures that I'm quoting give us comfort that that is God's way. But that principle principle of adding knowledge to our faith is his way. There must be a foundation of godly knowledge and understanding in the things of the spirit first. But we do not end there. We expand our understanding to include the things of the world, including literature, arts, and sciences. Now, Peter saying that, Daniel had exemplified that thousands of years before. Now, that's wonderful. I had never thought about Daniel as a scientist or a learned person. I thought of him as a noble person, you know, who was called into that place. But for Nebuchadnezzar to send the word out that I want those who have been well brought up in the knowledge, in the things of Israel, but not just commoners. I want people who are noble, of the royal type, but they should be cunning in wisdom and knowledge and understanding of sciences. Wow. So that paints a totally different picture. When Daniel, when he was brought into the king's court, now decides that I'm not going to defile myself with the wine from the king's table nor the meat thereof, but I'm going to have water. We're going to have water and vegetables and fruits. And when they tested them years after, a couple of years after, um, this was not just six months or called years after he stuck to this discipline for many years, they found him to be in terms of wisdom in the king's court, 10 times better than all the others who had been captured from other domains, put together even from Babylon to be trained for the king. And that's important. So his choice of vegetables and fruits was not just based on his religious affiliation. It was based on an understanding of science as well. That's who he was. You cannot delink how he lived his life you cannot delink that from who he was. 
So take note of that. To go on the path of excellence, continuously upgrading ourselves in knowledge is important. As young people who are building their lives, first you make sure that your spiritual life with God is on course. Grow in your faith. Be established in your faith. Make sure you get that right. But after you've established yourself in your faith, you don't end there. You now need to broaden your knowledge and understanding by learning. That means that you need to have a culture of reading. And I'm not only referring to going to school and acquiring degrees and certificates. That's, what, that's important. That's good. We do not deride that. Go for an MBA. Go for an MPhil. Go for a PhD. If, it, if you're required to do that, do that. But if you cannot go into the formal settings to learn, you need to build yourself in such a way that knowledge acquisition is a day-to-day -day thing you engage in. You need to have a roadmap for your own life that includes learning. And this is not because you want to position yourself for the job market. This is, this is because you want to become a well-rounded person. So what is a recommendation? Practical recommendation. There are tools on the market you can use. Uh, many of you go to LinkedIn to go and advertise yourself. Uh, but beyond the advertisement in the corporate environment for LinkedIn, um, there's a premium service you need to save a little money for and go and register. Now, you can come together as a group of friends and put the money together and pay for the subscription for a year. And you could always share the, the login details amongst yourself and get a glimpse into LinkedIn learning. It's almost like a, um, an online university. For any area of development that you want in your life, there are a bunch of online courses there. Now, believe you me, I've been in that space for many years and only used LinkedIn as a, as a professional advertisement website. <laughs> only to find in the space of personal development and code to find that anything that you want to have command of, in not just a corporate sense, but in a working sense, you can actually find materials to groom you on that platform. And that exposed me to a lot more other platforms like that, including Luma Workspaces, um, and um, this is the other one which, which, has, which has escaped me. Luma Workspaces, I remember, I remember that and I'll tell you about it. Um, platforms within which you can actually learn. Skillshare, exactly. Skillshare, Luma Workplaces, which are always available to teach you and to build you up outside the um, university and, and, and continuous learning platforms. And imagine if you put yourself in that space two or three hours a day. And that brings to mind one of the things that Jack Ma, the, the founder of Alibaba, once said. And he said that um, your 8 to 5 job, that's fine, is okay. Uh, but what you do after work between 6 and 9 p.m. will determine how successful you become in life later on. Because those are three hours after work between 6 and 9 that you do nothing with for the rest of your life. Now, if you dedicate two or three, hour, two or three days each week where after work between 6 and 9, you go onto any of these platforms and set yourself topics to learn on, imagine after three years the level of expansion of your mental faculties and your, and, your, and, your, and your knowledge base. And people always like to interact with people who are well-rounded in their thinking um, and who understand how to defend the faith that they have. Not just because we rattle things we've been told, but because we have a deeper understanding of ourselves, both in the scriptures that we've learned, but also in the application in the real world that we live in. And Daniel was that kind of person. Okay. So I'll just give you two more scriptures, right, in Daniel. And then, um, okay, we've got 15 more minutes. That's more than enough. Let's go to Daniel chapter 5. So Daniel chapter 5. Now, by this, Daniel chapter 5 was when Belshazzar, the king of Nebuchadnezzar, came onto the scene. The son of Nebuchadnezzar came onto the scene. Now, it's funny that Belshazzar, who was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, um, did not learn from the lessons of his father. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a very interesting character. The first three or four chapters of Daniel were dedicated to this man. And the interesting thing about him was the levels of oscillation between wisdom and stupidity that he demonstrated. And scripture captured all of them. In one vein, he'll be up, 
praising God and celebrating him and passing decrees that the whole of the people on the land should recognize Daniel's God as one of the greatest gods. In the next moment, he goes to the very heights of pride that makes God strike him down. And as though it is not enough, he just kept on repeating the same behavior, behavioral pattern again and again and again. So you would think that anybody who has been around the book of and seen the hand of God, first when it came to the dream that he had, and God chose to introduce the dream of the, of, the, of, the, of the kingdoms of the end time through the book at Nezer. And he comes and says, I've had a dream, and I don't remember what the dream is. Um, tell, me, tell me what the dream is and explain it. And the, the magicians of the time said, well, no, no king has asked anybody of this, so how can you ask us of this? And the book at Nezer said something that was very interesting at that point in time. He said, hey, hey, you guys, tell me now. Because you are trying to be cunning, and you, you are going to wait for the seasons to change. Now, that's an interesting statement for the king to make. That means that he knows that sometimes when things are about to happen, seasons will change. So these guys might not know the dream, but when the seasons begin to change, they can start telling him what is coming, just like the birth of Jesus Christ. They could see that a star had appeared. Something was happening. He says they could play him that card. He doesn't want that. So they should tell him, no, 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 the dream that he had, and then explain it to him. Amazing, isn't it? And Daniel, who had been serving the king's court for many years, said, okay, what's going on here? They're killing the, 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 the magicians and co. Cool. So tell the king to give us time, we'll come back. And God gave him an opportunity to, ex, to, to, to bring himself to the fore in the sight of the king. Because he had been amongst one of the guys in the seen as just everybody else, and God gave him an opportunity to shine. And he went back to his God and then asked for an interpretation and the demonstration of the dream and came back to explain it to the king. You would think that Nebuchadnezzar would be mindful about God after that. Immediately after that, he goes and builds himself an image and says, guys, you need to worship this. And you thought he would have learned. And then he, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were working in the king's court, says that, well, you know, we, we don't do these kind of things. And they, and they told the king and he said, what? But anyway, he liked them. So he gave them one more opportunity. He says, okay, 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 you guys, I've heard that you have disobeyed me, but they are going to play the song again so you can bow. And these three boys said, okay, you don't go that far. You see, you don't need to go and try to repeat the whole issue. We are telling them that we won't do it. <laughs> and it says that his visage was mad. He became so exceedingly furious that he could actually do it to his face. Amazing, isn't it? You thought he would have learned by what Daniel did for him. He throws them into the furnace and then they see somebody walking in there like the son of the gods. What am I saying? I'm trying to demonstrate who he was. And he was one of the greatest kings on earth at that time recorded by the Bible. As if that was not enough. Then he had the third dream. And in the dream he said he saw the watchers of heaven and somebody spoke to him. And after having been told the dream that he would be cut down and destroyed, he trembled. You thought he would have learned his lesson. Not too long afterwards, he stands on the balconies of Babylon and then the pride in his heart comes up again and says, see what I have built for myself. You thought he would have learned. Okay, so that is not even a problem, right? He had his own experiences when after seven years in the wilderness, he was brought back to life, um, brought back to his senses. The Bible doesn't record anything about him again, so he must have died a peaceful death. Then his son Belshazzar comes. You would have thought that Belshazzar might have been there all through these years, seeing what his father had gone through. And Belshazzar learned nothing. His father never drank in the, in the, in the cups, right, of the, of the, of the gold ornaments taken from the, from, the, from the temple in Jerusalem. He came and then did that. And the hand from the spirit wrote on the wall. And then he was trembling at the knees. And he wanted somebody to explain it to him. That's when Daniel comes back onto the scene again. But it is how Daniel appears on the scene that baffles me. So Daniel chapter 5 verse 11, when he was now looking, so as he was trembling from verse 10, his wife now comes and says, now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and, and his laws, came into the banquet house. And the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed, there is a man in thy kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods and in the days and in the days of the father light and understanding and wisdom. The queen could remember Daniel like that. But her husband couldn't. And you would think that it's the husband's dad who suffered all these things. Belshazzar should have known better. 
It is his wife, rather, who comes to tell him that, hey, my father-in-law had your, my father-in-law, your dad, had somebody in his court like this. And see how he describes him. The one in whom the spirit of the gods dwells. Uh, understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king, Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel. That was his CV that was spelled out there. His spiritual excellence put him above the astrologers, the magicians, and the others. But not only that, his ability to understand difficult sentences and riddles, political and policy statements... That's what the difficult sentences mean. He understood. Now, remember that Daniel was a Jew who had come to study the ways of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians. Yet he excelled in their own space and was set above them. That's why I took my time to lay the foundation of who Daniel was. He wasn't a street boy who was brought in. He was somebody who already was learned. His lifestyle was to learn. So he was described as a one who had an understanding of the sciences that are bringing matters. Now you might say that I was not brought up that way. That's fine. That's why I mentioned to you the platforms of knowledge and understanding that you can't participate in. So not only should you apply yourself to the things of the Bible and study them, that's the foundation Peter laid. Every one of us must be strong in that foundation. But secondly is to expand our thinking and our knowledge base. You can never get tired of learning. Are you with me? Okay. So we can stretch all of this to our own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and wonder, did he ever demonstrate that? Because if we are talking about things he didn't demonstrate, then we'll take with a pinch of salt. But in Matthew chapter 17, I think it's 27 onwards, when they came to him and accosted him and said, um, your people don't pay tax, Jesus gave them a lesson in the tax law. And he said, who's supposed to pay tax? <laughs> He gave them a lesson in the tax law. So he understood what the tax requirements of his regime was at that time. Now, so you could easily say that, oh, Jesus only knew the things of, of, of God because he was brought up in the synagogue. No, he was very well, well versed in the taxation regime of the Roman Empire at that time. But he said, nevertheless, for them not to trouble us, go catch a fish and take a gold coin out of his mouth and pay the taxes for my people. If he had not asked them that question, he would have said Jesus was ignorant. He was not ignorant. He understood the ways of the Romans that, he, uh, that, that had occupied um, um, Jerusalem at that time. And he understood what the tax regime was. That's just a glimpse into who he was. Even though he had come to save us and his life had been premised on what has been written in scripture. And Jesus was a studious person. At age 12 in Luke chapter 2 verse 48 to 52, he was found to be extremely wise. As a young man, questioning the doctors of the law and answering questions to them at age 12, such that they looked at him and they were astonished and they asked, whose child is this? That was age 12. And he continued in that studious nature till he, he started his ministry. So he looked at the 4 verse 16, he walks into the synagogue and they say, as was his custom, the way he had been brought up, he stood up to read. That's the Lord and master we walk after. And the apostles that came after him, Peter comes and tells us that to your faith, add knowledge. Are you with me? This one is extremely important. That's why I laid that foundation strong enough. And that's what set Daniel apart. Now, after Belshazzar had had his encounter and had been killed, when Darius took over in Daniel chapter 6, Darius was a king who had been, was, was one of the governors who had been around for a long while. He was strong in administration. Daniel now rearranges the kingdom and puts Daniel up there as one of the top three. So you could tell straight away that Darius was an administrator. He set up Babylon in such a way, set up the governance systems and co, and put Daniel as at one of the top three reporting to him. That comes to my next point. So we lay the foundation of our spiritual lives right. We add knowledge to it. 
Peter said that we should be careful that we have, um, we have virtue, we behave properly, good morals and cool. So in Daniel chapter 6, um, as Daniel was excelling, the Babylonian citizens, and, and you think that politics started today. It didn't start today. Machinations behind politics, it didn't start today. They looked at Daniel and decided, and I'm sure they might have said that this guy is a Jew. Why is he one of the most powerful people in Babylon? Such that the king even defers to him. So they sought to find a way to entrap Daniel. And they said, that, look, as for this guy, if we try anything relating to work, we will not get him. And that speaks of Daniel's integrity. Not the way we politicize integrity today. His work in itself stood out for itself. The people around him who wanted to bring him down said that if we want to bring this man down from the work that he does, the work is excellent. You can't find fault in the work that he does. And that's a, that's a pointer to us as we're growing up as young men. See, let our work speak for us. See, we don't work as unto men, but we work as unto God. So the standards that we apply to the work that we do, it is according to the standards that we expect God to demand from us. Not whether our boss is watching or not, or whether our boss is a demanding boss or not, or whether our boss is a soft boss or not. Our personal standards must be beyond what men ask us for. And that's how come they couldn't find, in, find any fault in what Daniel would do. Now that's, that's interesting for me. That they said, that, okay, the only thing we can do is to find fault in the way that he serves his God. So they really schemed around him. And they went to the king and told the king that, okay, king, um, can we tell that nobody should worship any other god? So they didn't tell the king why they were doing that. <laughs> and the king said, well, of course it's right. If you are in this kingdom, you should worship the gods that we serve. So the king, now they get the king to pass a law. Okay. So when the king passes the law, and Daniel knew that the law had been passed, he now goes back. And this time when he's prayed, he opens his windows towards Jerusalem so he can pray loudly enough for those who want to bring him down to here. That is the only time he said how he prayed. Now, when he knew that the, the trap had been set, he stuck to his commitment and his dedication to his God. Then the king realized that they had played him a card. So, like, oh, king, did you say that if anybody worships another God? But the king said, yes, I said so. He said, ah, your man Daniel, he has a book in the law. And straight away, the king realized the card had been played. And the scripture says that he sought to find a way in the law to get Daniel out. The whole day, he sat with the lawyers and found a way. The guys waited for him. In the evening, they came back and said, Abi, O king, you know that in, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, when you say something, you have to do it. <laughs> How wicked can they be? So the king realized he had played him a card. And he walked with Daniel to the den and said that, Daniel, may your God that you serve, save you. Okay, that's, that's, that doesn't seem to be enough. He said the king himself fasted that night. Can you imagine a king fasting for one of his people? He said he could not eat. He took neither meat nor drink. He fasted the whole night and prayed for one of his people who had broken the law of the land. Ah, ah, ah. May God cause such spirit of excellence to be found in us that our bosses will be on their knees at night on our behalf because of what kind of excellence they find in us. So the king did not sleep the whole night. At dawn, he rushed to the tomb and screamed, Daniel, has your God saved you? He said, oh, kid, hold your peace. Me and the dials, we did chill for here. And the moment he brought Daniel out, he unleashed his fury on those who had put the plot together, carried them and their families and their children and tossed them in there. Such was the fury of the king. But it was his passion on behalf of Daniel. To have the whole kingdom arrayed positively behind one man, only God could do that. And scripture continuously said, said in Daniel 5, 11 to 12, and Daniel 6, 3, he kept on saying, and the spirit of excellence was found in him. That's a standard set for us. A lifelong standard. And after Daniel chapter 6, if you look at 7 to 12, now many a time we read Daniel in a chronological order 
But if you read 7 to 12, actually the references he made there were the visions he had between Daniel 1 and Daniel 6. Funny. So we always read it as one long book. But when he starts capturing the visions, he now captures when he had the vision. And he'll tell you, I had this one during the reign of the king Belshazzar, which was earlier in chapter 5. One in the reign of the king of Darius, which was in chapter 6. So he captured the dreams he had during that period. So Daniel was doing his work during that period towards excellence and still having spiritual and divine encounters whilst at work. And it never became an excuse for non-performance at work. That's the one that baffled me. He was at the height of his prophet life. Having heavenly encounters of the ancient of days. Having heavenly encounters of the days to come. And still being excellent at work. Such that Darius the king was fighting on his behalf to have him alive. And that the queen was reminding the king that there's a man within whom the spirit of the gods lives and excellence, wisdom, and knowledge is his portion. Let's go and talk to him. When you live a life of excellence, people speak on your behalf. In the courts of the kings when discussions are being had, God will ensure somebody will speak on your behalf. Okay, so can I just summarize these into the simpler things that we can remember? And I think the easiest way to look at this is to look at um, Second Peter chapter, um, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, because it captures it nicely and talks about, first, the foundation of our faith. Um, we work through all of this with extreme hard work. Uh, it's, we don't have a lazy lifestyle. Uh, we build our foundation of faith strongly, and then we add good morals to it. We add knowledge to it. Um, we add... Um, Temperance, that is self-control. We, we add brotherly kindness and then love to it. And then we came to demonstrate how these things have all played out in life. Um, and we, used, we looked at the example of Daniel, one upon whom the spirit of excellence was upon. And we said that if you look at Daniel's life, um, aside the fact that he was a Jew brought up properly and had a very solid spiritual base, he was also a very learned person. Um, knowledge, skilled in knowledge, cunning in wisdom, and understood sciences. And in, in, um, in Peter's demonstration of the things that will lead to a very fruitful life in God, he goes ahead to say, add to your faith, add virtue, and to your virtue, add knowledge. And the definition of knowledge he puts there is be erudite in the arts and the sciences. That means that go and expand your thinking and learn. Read as much as you can. And then add good behavior and morals to it. And integrity. Daniel demonstrated good behavior and morals and integrity in what he did. And that, for me, is the blueprint for excellence. And I will always remember when I was um, establishing myself first and foremost in my first managerial stint. And that was in 2006. I remember the word of the Lord clearly to me then. And it says that to climb to the top, what you need to pay attention to is competence and capacity. I didn't read this out of any book. These were clearly the words that the Lord spoke to me. He says, competence. He said, get the books that matter. Read, read in your field of study. He says, get the papers that matter so that when they talk about the things in your field of study, you talk sense. <laughs> Not only do you talk sense, he said, Learn the cap build the capacity in you. And the capacity is your ability to solve problems in that area. So competence shows that, yes, we understand the foundational knowledge and principles that are applied, but capacity is the ability to solve problems in your area. He said, get the two together for excellence. So we don't stop to learn, whether it is science, whether it is the arts, whether it's business, whichever field, continuously reading and learning is important. In the areas of parenting, relationships, and co, continue to expand your knowledge. People are researching and finding things out every day. Be abreast with them. But unlike the world, we build this external knowledge on the foundation of our knowledge of Jesus Christ and our work with God. That means as a child of God, knowing your Bible from the beginning to the end is a given. When that is in place, then we can all the others to it and would have built the solid foundation um, to excellence. I think at this point in time, I can begin to take questions and um, address what questions the audience might have um, so that we can we can bring this to a close. Thank you very much. I'll take my seat and come up when there are questions for me to address. Thank you. Praise God. 
you agree with me that it's been good. If you have any questions, you can write them at the, on, on the chat side of the um, of your Zoom um, page. But I have the first question. My first question is, is excellence the same as perfection? The Bible says, be ye perfect. And then Romans 3.10 says, there's none righteous. In fact, Romans 3 16 also says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So is excellence the same as perfection? or wrongdoing. Um, I would take that as a state. I would take excellence as a continuous way of living your life. And that for me is important. So we might not be there today, but as we strive towards excellence, if we get the right ingredients into our life, then we're on the pathway to excellence. And that for me is an important thing. And the blueprint that Daniel put down, I'm sorry, as Peter put down, um, helps us on that pathway to excellence. So to ensure that you have these ingredients of moral excellence in your life, you have these ingredients of continuous knowledge gathering in your life, these ingredients of demonstrating brotherly kindness and love, um, adding these into the mix puts you on the pathway to excellence. So I'll say excellence is a journey. Um, Perfection is probably the ultimate pinnacle at the top of that, of that journey. So do not beat yourself if you, do not, you are not at the perfection stage yet. But excellence is a day-to-day -day struggle. And we will make mistakes. We will not be there fully in knowledge. We might have weaknesses in love. But so far as we are building ourselves towards that, we are on the right path. And that's what God demands from us. Within our level of experience and exposure and knowledge, he wants us to stay true to the things we've learned and try to practice them as much as we can. And for me, that's all that you are being asked of to do under the Courageous uh, Men series. Uh, pardon, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's for us to try to strive towards that state of perfection, but understanding clearly what the ingredients are and applying those ingredients to our life. Thank you. There's another question. Please stay there. <laughs> the second question is, King Nebuchadnezzar kept to his word. He kept to his word. Yes. According to the law, he had to cast Daniel into the den, and he did. Yes. That was not Nebuchadnezzar, it was Darius, yeah. It was in Nebuchadnezzar, correct. Yeah. Thank you. Now, God saved Daniel. Is excellence measured by being law-abiding only, or it is measured by another means. Another standard. Okay. And then who measures excellence? Is it yourself? Is it society? Is it the law? Is it God? Who determines excellence? Okay, that's wonderful. I'll start from the second one. Excellence, we live our lives of excellence in, this, in the sight of God. He has the ultimate measure of what excellence is. And most importantly, if you look at Daniel's life, you notice that it, it, they kept on making the statement that the spirit of the gods is upon him. Now, therefore, it tells you that the strength and the, and, the, and the drive for excellence is not a human thing. It's something that is powered by the Spirit of God in our lives. And that's why I kept on saying that we have a distinct advantage over the people of the world because they do not have the Spirit of God power in their lives, which is a fundamental drive towards excellence. So that statement that kept on being made about Daniel, that the spirit of excellence was upon him, they could tell there was something about him that brought this thing out. So as children of God, we have that spirit of God in us, which builds excellence in our lives. The most important thing for us is for us to listen to him. And that's, those are the things, the ingredients towards excellence are what Peter spoke about. First, make sure that you are a hardworking person, giving all diligence. So God eschews laziness. 
now, it is not that God permits it. He has choose it. You need to look through scripture and see all the references to laziness. None of them is complimentary. In fact, Paul comes and says that he who does not work must not eat, saying that the one who does not apply himself is worthy of death. That's a very strong thing to say. And Peter says that giving all diligence. So, number one step to excellence is hard work. But your hard work must be directed properly. Otherwise, you're just working hard anyhow. And it says that first, your hard work must be towards your faith. Your faith must be something that takes your time and energy to grow in your knowledge and understanding of God. You don't just take it anyhow. You need to focus on that. Build knowledge in yourself. The books you have to read, the Bible itself, authors who have penned things which are interesting, who are skilled in certain areas of scripture, learn. Before you now come and add the good morals, it says virtue. Virtues is good moral. Practice being a, a good person, an honest person. Um, have all the positive things, and then you now go as they add knowledge and add brotherly love and kindness and co. Those ones you cannot measure them. But he's talking about ingredients that must be in your life. If you have these ones, and as a child of God, you are powered by the Holy Spirit, you are set for the life of excellence. Then the, the first question was Nebuchadnezzar kept his word. Uh, yeah, Darius. Darius, Darius kept his word. Yes, yes that is right. Um, as a king, he demonstrated that. You cannot break your word. Your word is your bond. And, the, and the, that's why the people got him to pass a law first. Because if you pass it into law, then you cannot break it. So he, they got him to pass it into law, then they got him to say something. And then he realized that as a king, holding your word is extremely important. And the same thing about God. He said God has exalted his word far above his name. So everything he says, he will do. And as children of him, we need to watch what we say. That's why Jesus says that every idle word that you utter, you shall be judged for it. He said, be careful about what you say before you say it. Because when you say things, you'll be held accountable for them. If you want to live a life of excellence, um, talk less, listen more, think before you speak. Awesome. Please stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Me before you come. So I have gone through this course and I feel excellent. Is it wrong for me to go about saying that I am excellent? I am an excellent man. Build the middle name called excellence. <laughs> <laughs> Is it wrong? Will, I, will, I, will people I'll, say I'll I'm make proud? reference. I'll make reference to Daniel. Daniel never went about saying he was excellent. He never. In fact, when the issue arose in Belshazzar's time, it was Belshazzar's wife who came and said that, ah, O oh king, live forever. But you king, excuse me, you know they think. <laughs> in your dad's time, there was somebody like that. She became an advocate for Daniel. And if we truly are living a life of excellence, our advocates are never ourselves. People from the outside would advocate on our behalf. Even our enemies would advocate. The reason why they wanted to bring Daniel down was because they saw something in him. And they said, that, look, if we want to get Daniel by his work, he ain't nyano. So in their own words were their testimony about the man that the way he conducts himself is above reproach. So it should never be somebody else, never be us telling people we are excellent. Let them tell us we are excellent. And sometimes they will tell us where our faults are. We are human. When we hear those faults, we take them in good faith and we work on the faults. That is still the path to excellence and that's what God expects of us. Thank you. There's one question here from Peter Kwame Enning. He says, is perfection attainable? God wants us to strive for perfection. Now, many a time people read the Bible, be perfect as your father and above is, uh, above is perfect. The Greek definition of that actually says be mature. God first demands maturity from us. And that whole discussion on Christian growth and establishment is a whole, a whole course on its own that we need to spend time on. God demands maturity from us. But his grace sustains us even though we might not be personally perfect all the time. But he demands maturity from us. And what is maturity? Maturity is demonstrating, permit me the use of this word, dexterity in managing these issues in your life where you are in charge of your life and not circumstances in charge of you. That's maturity. Somebody who has learned to use God's word in his life, built his life on the foundation of God's word, and has tasted that indeed God's word is good, and he has demonstrated that God's word works. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14 tells us that. God calls us to that level of maturity. He knows that 
Perfection is a target that is difficult to attain. But he pushes us on that onward journey always. And that's what Paul says that we must continuously work out our salvation, forgetting the things which are behind us and striving for the things which are ahead of us. So he acknowledges that it's a journey. You never reach there, but you keep on pushing. Our reward in heaven is dependent on is depend how far we went along on that journey. Not whether we attained it or not, but how far we went along on that journey. Wow. Ni, you have a question. Ni has a question. What question could that be? <laughs> Please so, come forward so we'll see you. So, so we've learned that, <laughs> we've learned that uh, excellence is a journey. Yes. And that, uh, uh, in my mind, it is that I cannot be at the level I was yesterday. Um, and there's a target, that, that level of perfection, you're striving for it. It's always in sight. Yeah. And just like your, your performance at the Olympic Games, every single time they break that record, they know they are ripe for that next record. And they are taking the bar up every single time. So it's, it's a, it's a I, I like particularly the focus you keep on the fact that it's, it's focused on, it's a standard that is not of this world. It is a standard that is God's. And once you keep your eye on it, you just keep traveling towards it, irrespective of all the standards around you. And he provides support. And he provides support. The Holy Spirit powers it. He said, I need you desperately to paint a picture. Because in this world, too, there are people who strive for excellence. There are people who are excellent people. And you've, you've come across people like that in your life. You know, they, they've got their health. <laughs> you know, they exercise. They are the peak of their performance. Um, you know, intellectually, professionally, and all of that one. I need you to paint a portrait of who someone who is excellent as a Christian um, is versus excellence as the world is. And pick any portrait, either professional, in the family, at church, or any other setting, in, so that we can actually make the the, the comparisons. So if you take someone who is um, a chief strategy officer somewhere else, <laughs> who, is also, who is also pursuing excellence, and Tete Aite, what would that difference look like? <laughs> or, or, you know, CEO uh, Sololati, what should, that, what, what should that difference look like? So we have two examples of excellence standing before us in, front, in the persons of Nia Makate and and um, Solomon Lati. Is that a good enough portrait for you? <laughs> Why not? In all my years of professional um, interaction with these two, I can stick my neck out and say that they're good examples for us as young people who are growing up. Now, many of you might probably not know Nee's history, um, and he probably would not want me to talk about it. But so you, did, you, you probably did not know that between 1992 and 1994, me and him were vice presidents in our Writers and Debaters Club. 1992. So you can imagine. So that's roughly about 30 years ago. He's always been an excellent writer, and that's how come he's very dexterous with words. Okay, so now you want a portrait. <laughs> but see, that's why I, the portrait that we're looking for is painted in 2 Peter 1, 5, 5 and 6. And that's why I took my time to try to expand on it. Um, you did not mention that people who are at the top of their professional lives, they have excellent fiscal conditions. Um, there are people like that who are great contributors to discussions and stuff like that. They are, they are supremos in their fields. Um, in God's side, the picture of excellence that he's looking for is first somebody who's first and foremost have their lives premised on him. That's important. Because excellence in the sight of God without a foundation of a, of, of a spiritual relationship with him is no excellence. Without a foundation of a spiritual relationship with him is no excellence. So first, it is premised on a spiritual relationship with him. David, Joseph, Daniel demonstrated first and foremost that spiritual relationship with him. Then comes the pursuit of knowledge. Joseph was well versed in the things of, 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 of Israel, sorry, of Egypt at that time. 
the 14 years he spent in jail and in Potiphar's house enhanced his understanding of the systems of Egypt. Such that when he was made prime minister, he passed laws which are in existence till today. He understood how the system worked. David was a shepherd boy who penned so much of the Bible in the area of Psalms. How did, where did he get that knowledge from? He sought knowledge. When you come to Daniel, you see exactly the same thing. So, first and foremost, it's premise on a spiritual life. And I mentioned Nia Mankra and Steve uh, so, Solomon because the relationship is there with God is there. Spending time in church today, investing time in helping young people demonstrates a certain relationship with God in the foundation. And that's extremely important. Before we add good morals, behaviors, before we add knowledge, and then we add, add brotherly love and kindness. You can't measure better love and kindness, can you? No, you can't. So if you look at somebody who has these ingredients, you know they're on their pathway to excellence. Living the life of the exemplary life. Now, what I, 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 I seek not to do is try to find just one area set an example in. Because what this was given is a combination of all of these. And God does acknowledge that people are at different stages of their journey of excellence. But he demands from us that we do embark on that journey and not throw our hands up in the air. And Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14 talks about babes and matured people in the Lord. And Paul told them that even though by now you ought to be matured people, you are not. That's not an acceptable standard. You have to move towards maturity. And in, in moving towards maturity, once we demonstrate these ingredients, you now begin to paint the picture and the portrait of excellence. Somebody who has brotherly love demonstrated in his life, um, showing love and kindness towards the believers. He's able to do that. He's continuously well-read. He's an example in management, in science, in, um, in fashion, in, um, in, um, in, in business management, in politics. Um, he's able to talk about governance of people in the right way, according to the principles of God, according to the learnings of the world today, and apply them to his faith. Are you going to get a picture of excellence? So there can be two people who are well-versed in politics, right? And one is skilled in the ways of undermining people and getting things done in the political sense. And that person is skilled in the ways of getting things done God's way. And it is possible to govern people God's way today, understanding what God's demand and desires are for governing people and doing that. Those ingredients are key for excellence. And for me, it's a, it's a matter of looking for how much of those ingredients are demonstrated. That's your measure and the portrait of excellence. Are we, are we fine? But understand that whichever role models you would have, they themselves are on the pathway to perfection. So you would have role models in excellence, and it's great. There are people who are great role models for us. Um, you want me to mention names? No, you'd rather not I mention names. Uh, great role models for us. But I've, I've worked with people. Um, um, off the top of my head, uh, Madame Joyce Ayi is a great example. I've, I've worked with her for, since 2011, November, um, on the Harmonious Choral Project. And I can tell who, he is and her, who she is and what her passion is. I learned a lot from her by just observing her and walking um, um, beside her in all the functions that I, I work with her on. Um, there, there are a lot more people like that in circles around us. And some of them are not so prominent but if you could find these ingredients in their lives, they are role models and examples of excellence um, for you. And for me, the important thing is to look for the ingredients. Brotherly love, care, knowledge gathering. You can have um, a continuous conversation with them that is always stimulating, not only biased in one direction. They can demonstrate to you the connection between worldly knowledge and biblical principles and how they all come together in, in, in providing a platform for excellence for people. Having a conversation with such people is so stimulating that you don't want to stop. You could spend the whole night talking to them till morning and you could still not have exhausted all the things you want to talk about. All those things are pointers and very good pointers. I believe we are done now. <laughs> There's another question. No, there's no question. Thank you. Okay. So I got it right. <laughs> so on that note, I'll say thank you very much. I hope um, it's been helpful um, and some kind of um, impression has been made um, on you. Um, personally, excellence is something I always strive for. It's, it's important to me that we set our standards um, high and maybe 
me, this is where I tell a little bit of my story. Um, and I remember in 1996, um, I, I so wanted to... I, I'm a firm believer that it doesn't matter where you're born in this world, you can compete with the best in this world. Uh, maybe it's the school I went to. Um, in fact, Slim sort of molded me that way. And I'm not sort of throwing shade. You know, you know we like that. <laughs> but in fact, Slim sort of built us up in a way where so when, once you get onto campus, we didn't have the best lecturers. It was very clear from day one we didn't have the best teachers. And that was drummed into you by the, sim, uh, the symbol um, of the, of, what do we call it? Um, the, pardon me. The faithful eight um, in the, the octagon, um, in, in, in the burning flame that is lit once a year. And, and they did not have teachers and they still passed their O-level exams. So that was drummed into you from day one. So therefore, personal learning and improvement was a foundation that was built into us right from get-go. And I am forever, ever grateful for that foundation. Forever grateful. Um, so the things that we learned, we learned them. I don't know how to explain them. We did not have copious notes and vacation classes and those things to build them upon. We, we technically had to learn. That means I had to sit with me and understand how series was. Or you know, we had to understand those principles. Then we felt we were a bit disadvantaged. But that upbringing later on in life became an extremely solid asset. It's the reason why I'm able to undertake the personal learning like I do naturally. Uh, go on to Blinkist and, and pay for these things and listen to the Blinks and buy the audio books in areas that you want to learn. Use your time driving to work back and forth to gather knowledge always. And you realize that God has always been pushing us in the direction of knowledge. You doesn't know that. The one who made the stars made the watermelon seed. In between those two extremes, this is the might of his creativity and we call him our father. So that has always driven me from, from, from day one. And then my encounter with him in 2006 when he said build competence and, and capacity in your life made me know that the learning has no end. I cannot go and hide behind the fact that I'm a Christian. So I don't, uh, 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 it is because I am a Christian that I cannot afford to disappoint. And so therefore gathering knowledge and being erudite, well thought, well read in the areas of discussion is extremely important. So thank you very much. It was great talking to you online, all of you. Grateful for your questions, and I hope to encounter you in person one day in the very near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ni. Um, before Mr. Tetaitevi comes with his assignment for us, I'm excited particularly because for me, I'm, I'm trying to summarize everything he said in two sentences. Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. For me, everything he said tells me that as a child of God, you should, you should strive for excellence. You should strive for excellence physically, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and have I left one? And mentally, okay. So for me, this is it. And my takeaway is our personal standards must be beyond what men ask us for. Quote, Tete Ayitevi. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will invite him to give us this assignment, then we will pray and go. God bless you. So my assignment is pretty simple. Um, you heard me make reference to Daniel. Your assignment is going to read the book of Daniel, and if you have a platform for the courageous men, um, th those who are on the, on the program, I'd want them, in the light of this discussion, after having read Daniel, come up with your takeaways of things you didn't notice, didn't know were there, that you found in your study of Daniel after this session. I'll give you an easy way out. You can read it, or you can download the audio version of your Bible. Now, there are audio versions of the Bible, and listen. So I just made it more difficult for you not to do it. 
If you say you don't have time to read, no problem. Plug your earpiece in your ears, stick your earpiece in your ears, and then turn the audio Bible on and listen to the book of Daniel. And tell me, in your own context, what you've walked away from that book in a way of excellence that you didn't know before. That's the assignment. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's a pretty simple assignment, and we should all be able to do it. Shall we pray? Our Father, again, in Jesus' name, do we thank you for these messages we've had. We thank you for excellence. You said we should strive for perfection. Your word says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we know that with you on our side, we can achieve excellence. Please visit us today. Grant us grace. Grant us the strength to become what you want us to be. Even as we depart from these discussions today, we pray that you continue to remind us of the things that we've studied. Grant us grace to also continue to study more so that we will attain excellence and you will be glorified in our lives. We thank you, Father, for hearing us. May glory, adoration, honor, and praise be unto your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. May God bless you. Tomorrow we are meeting same um, time, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. So make it a point to log in. If you want to join us in this auditorium too, we will be here. And tonight, uh, tomorrow night too, the men will be praying at 8.30. So you can still log in and join us. God bless you.